Okay, so let me start with a summary of the paper. So the paper starts from, you know, the literature on production networks. And now there is a well-developed uh, uh, literature on it. And, um, and they take the kind of standard model uh, there and they add, you know, the, uh, on the, the innovation on the theoretical part is to add this key parameter which is going to capture the degree of uh, labor mobility across sectors. Because in standard models, uh, um, typically you will have uh, um, free mobility of labor and so you will have only one, uh, one wage in equilibrium. And here with uh, uh, frictions to labor mobility, you, you, you may start uh, generating differences in, in, in wages across sectors. Okay, so they do a lot of things, but I wanted to just, you know, put a, a picture of, of maybe the main uh, equation of this paper, which is <coughs> this one here that, in fact, Glenn already uh, presented, which is giving you how wages in each sector I is going to respond to a, a, a productivity shock in another sector. And you will have these three terms here, the labor centrality channel, which is, uh, in fact, in equilibrium, proportional to the wage bill of that sector. This we know from uh, prior work. Then you will have uh, the labor supply channel, which is uh, uh, you know, capturing the fact when, we, when you have a positive productivity shock in another sector, uh, uh, maybe you will have entry, more labor entering into the other sector I uh, and depressing the wage. Okay, and so this is a force that is kind of pushing wages to be the same in all sectors. And then you have this aggregate channel at the end, which is just how GDP in general goes up when you have a positive productivity shock in a given sector. Okay, there are a lot of uh, uh, interesting results in this paper. Um, so what I want, so first thing that I want to say is that a very uh, promising paper, uh, and in fact, is is also a well-developed paper, so there are already a lot of, of things. But I would like to focus my uh, discussion on two dimensions where I think the analysis uh, in general could be uh, deepened. The first part is going to be the link of the model with you know, data and facts on income inequality. So when you read the paper, you understand it's very much centered on uh, the literature on production networks, but much less on what we know about uh, income inequality. So I want to do this exercise of trying to no. <laughs> think about uh, how good the model is to, to kind of map facts on inequality. So I'll just show some uh, facts on it and, and, and try to open that discussion on that uh, dimension. And then I would like to come back to the model and, and think about uh, uh, that new assumption, which is here compared to prior work, which is frictions to labor mobility. Um, for the moment, is, is, a, is a friction that applies uniformly to all sectors of the economy, and you may want in an extension of the model to make it more uh, sector specific, because there is a bit this intuition that when you are in a given sector, you can maybe easily move to other industries that are related in terms of skills, while it might be difficult to go in other sectors, but the, these frictions probably are kind of uh, sector specific, and here we like, you know, just also to open the discussion there. Okay, so let me start with, uh, uh, you know, relating the model to data and facts on income inequality. Before showing you some graphs, uh, just let me re-say something that Glenn has already said. Of course, under perfect labor mobility, when you have a productivity shock in one sector, you will generate uh, uh, you know, wages in all sectors who are going to be uh, uh, the same in equilibrium, and so you will not have labor in income inequality. To have an income inequality in that model, uh, uh, you will need to have uh, the friction to uh, the frictions to labor mobility and the sorry the differences that is, are going to uh, generate are differences across sectors. Okay, so there is income inequality in that model to the extent that wages differ across sectors, which raises a natural question, which is, but are differences in wages across sectors in the real life an important driver of in, in, in income inequality or not? Okay. So let me uh, uh, show you some graphs. So this, I'm going to show you in fact graphs from the US. It's not that I think the model should map this fact because of course the calibration of your model is based on Belgium data. So income inequality might have uh, you know, evolved in other directions. So it's just more uh, take this as a thought experiment of doing the same thing on, on Belgium. 
But for the US, so we know that income inequality has increased since the, the 70s. Uh, and sorry, the source of uh, these graphs are coming from this uh, uh, Journal of Economic Perspective recent paper here. And they use, so for the US, micro data where they observe, sorry, I didn't want to do, I didn't want to do this. They use data where they have wages uh, for a sample of, uh, of workers. The first thing that I want to say is that in the literature on income inequality, you will have papers trying to understand what is happening at the top one or top 0.1%, which is not uh, the object of, uh, of interest of that paper. So these uh, uh, individuals here are removed from, from that part. And so when you look at the general population, you will have this trend. And the first thing which is interesting to note here is that in income inequality, the labor in income equality part is in fact the uh, largest, uh, uh, the most important part, which, which is good news for the model because you don't, it means that as a first pass, you can kind of uh, forget about, uh, I don't know, uh, business income, entrepreneurs, capital, and this kind of stuff because most of the variation come from uh, labor income inequality. Okay. So, of course, for Europe, uh, depending on the countries, it might be rather flat. In Belgium, I don't know. In France, I know it has not increased that much. But then if you look at the literature, there are, in fact, many drivers of, of uh, income inequality. So um, you can think of, and if you think about how the literature has evolved, recently, they, I mean, or recent papers in the last two decades, I would have that would tend to show that the most important drivers are related to differences in education attainments between individuals, or uh, uh, the fact that uh, different individuals have different skills, and these skills have been, re been rewarded differently on the labor market because there have been ch uh, technological changes, so that would be uh, Asimoglu and, and Otto. And then you can think of specific shocks that have happened over the last uh, uh, 20 years that are kind of you know, interacting with uh, these differences in education and skills. So in comp import competition that have kind of depressed uh, uh, wages of uh, low-skilled workers. Uh, robotization that also would have maybe displaced uh, 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 low-wage workers. And then you may also think about shocks on, on the labor market uh, like uh, uh, minimum wages, unionization, and so on and so forth. Okay, so here you are bringing a new, uh, uh, a new possibility, which is changes in if if you want to say something about uh, drivers in eco income inequality in the real life, uh, that uh, potential other explanation, which are changes in frictions to labor mobility. But you never say it would be interesting to to to, to say explicitly whether you think they have increased over time, decreased over time, been you know, for which types of sector and so on. Okay. But again, to coming back to what are the uh, different characteristics that have contributed the most to income inequality here, I wanted to, you know, show this graph that comes from the same paper where they do a variance decomposition uh, approach, meaning they have wages for a lot of individuals and they observe different characteristics, education, age, occupation, industry, Okay, and, and they try to understand which, which of these characteristics has been the most important to explain differences in wages across individuals. There are some figures between the figure one and figure four that I've shown you, but what I want to uh, show on this graph is that when you start running a regression of wages on different components and then you uh, extrapolate from this uh, what is explaining the most, uh, uh, the variance of, of income inequality, you will find that the biggest contributor is this, uh, what is the baseline here, which are in fact differences in education and experience, where experience is uh, explained by age. Then you see that occupation is uh, explaining also an important part and that industry is still there, but it's pretty small. So uh, to the extent that what you generate comes from just differences in industry, this is going, at least for the US, be the small part that you, you explain. Uh, you, you explain. And so, and this is, I mean, there is a big distinction that for the moment you, 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 you try to explain, dif uh, you focus on differences coming from uh, 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 choices of industry where 
and, and, and the literature instead have kind of moved to differences in occupation and skill requirements. And I thought that a nice extension of your framework would be, in fact, to incorporate this in your model, to have still differences in, in, in uh, coming from, uh, from the choice of your industry, which still matter, but also maybe within industry to have two groups with the low skill and the high skill and see to what extent you can kind of uh, uh, get closer to, to these uh, differences in income inequality. Okay, so that would be the first part of, oh, this is the first part of my discussion. Now I want to uh, <coughs> come back to frictions uh, to uh, labor mobility. And so for the moment, uh, you don't really say what you have in mind for uh, the frictions to labor mobility. In the modeling, you, have a, you, you mentioned these uh, uh, taste preferences, but also in terms of policy, you want to say something about training and this kind of stuff. And so I think it would be nice to, to, to say explicitly what, you are, what are for you the micro foundations for the frictions to labor mobility that you have in the model. Because, of course, it could be restricted to taste. I want to maybe not work in a polluting sector and I want to stay in a green sector, but it could also be that I have been born or raised with a set of skills uh, that uh, in my own history and that, that are more or less easy to, to, to transfer to other industries. Okay, because of course the implication of uh, one choice or the other is going to be crucial for, uh, for what you have. Going back to, my pr to the first part of our discussion, of course these uh, 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 frictions to labor mobility, they might have in fact to do, uh, be very much related to uh, uh, your occupation specific skills and, and, um, and to the extent that two industries are very close in terms of the occupation mix, uh, this could explain why they are high in some sectors and low in the others. Okay, so this is in terms of the micro foundations. Now in terms of, uh, of uh, all the uh, uh, data, I thought that you could also be more precise or more granular in the way you model labor, uh, labor, uh, frictions to labor uh, mobility and model the fact that uh, they are likely to be uh, specific to two pairs of uh, industries. Okay, one way of doing it would be to t explicitly take into account this uh, 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 labor mobility matrix between sectors. Okay, I saw in the proposal or in the first slide that you sent me that you wanted to put, to have it in the model, but in the, in the paper they are not. And so uh, I guess you are trying to think about how to do it and, and probably it's not, it's not easy, but I want to show you some data at least from the corporate finance literature on that transition matrix. So this is a table from a paper from uh, Geoff, uh, Tate, and, uh, and Young. Uh, they use data from the US and <coughs> they look at, uh, they show employment flows between uh, two industries in the, in the uh, yes, between two industries at, at a pretty uh, aggregated level. Okay, and they want to, in the paper, they do this to, to say that this has implications for mergers and acquisitions. You have more mergers and acquisitions where uh, skills are, are, are kind of uh, uh, similar. Okay, and what they find is that, of course, uh, uh, workers, they tend to move uh, in a relatively uh, small set of, of industries. So just to, to show you how this uh, uh, matrix work, uh, table work here, you have the industry of origin, the industry of destination, and, and here you just uh, compute the share of uh, flows that you, uh, of workers in, from industry I to J. Okay, and you see that in the health sector, a lot of them move to uh, uh, personal services. Okay, probably because a set of skills is very, is very, is very similar between the two industries. Okay, so you can reconstruct this matrix and, and put it in the, in the model. And of course here it raises a, l a lot of uh, interesting questions. The first thing that we may want to know is the overlap between that matrix and the input-output matrix. Okay, so wholesale and retail, we see a lot of flows and these are two industries that are also related in the input-output matrix. And probably depending on the overlap between these two matrix is going to have different implications for how shocks propagate uh, across sectors in the economy. So I guess this is where you, you want to go, but uh, I thought it, 
it was interesting to highlight here, here in, my, in my discussion. Okay, so I stop here and uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity to read your very interesting paper. Thanks.